Okay, so when I made this channel, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance was on the short list of definitely gonna talk about this at some point games. Spoilers, but it's always been one of my favorite games. It's been on my top 10 since the day it came out, and I don't think it's gonna get dethroned anytime soon. I was obsessed with this game back in the day. Like, I'm talking on a level that I used to post no damage boss speedruns on daily motion, and oh boy do I still wish I had those videos lying around, but I, uh... I have the receipts. I try to centralize all my videos around a main theme that I want to talk about, and the Metal Gear Rising one was going to be no exception. Metal Gear Rising didn't exactly launch to an explosive fanfare. It had its fans, but it was mostly considered a too wacky, too short 7 out of 10 by the mainstream. I mean, I unironically saw some places giving it a 4. The original theme of this video was going to be about what it's like when a game you consider to be a favorite isn't exactly the highest rated thing in the world, and wondering if it'll hit you the same way when you replay it years later. Or at least, that was the original theme, but uh... Check the internet lately. Show me. How did they... A story leaked early. Metal Gear Rising is back, baby. Over the past year or so, it seems that Metal Gear Rising has re-entered the cultural zeitgeist out of almost nowhere. I don't get it. I don't know what's happening here. I don't care what's happening here. We're reaching complete global saturation and there ain't no signs of stopping. And I mean, yeah, this is a game where you fistfight an American senator on top of a giant robot after he shows you what's trending on Twitter. It sounds like what you'd get if you fed a bunch of data to an AI and it spat out a random string of words. It's absolutely insane. But it's specifically that kind of insanity that leads to Metal Gear Rising providing one of the most unique, the most hype, most absolutely adrenaline-filled experiences I think I've ever had in my life. Sans cap. So let's talk about this thing. I want to talk about Metal Gear Rising, break it down, and talk about how it holds up today after a 2022 playthrough. Let's not waste any time and get right into it. You've probably heard this story before, so I won't give you the full history lesson, but Metal Gear Rising Revengeance was pretty much the miracle game that shouldn't have happened. Basically, after Metal Gear Solid 4, Genius Kajumbo, well-known creator of international super hit Deadly Stranding, and his studio, Kojima Productions, were in the market to make a spin-off game in the MGS universe. The original, original concept was to make a side story about the boss and the Cobra unit from 3, and oh boy do I wish that saw the light of day. The next concept they went with was a side story originally just titled Metal Gear Rising, and it was going to be about Raiden saving Sunny from the Patriots, setting it somewhere before the events of MGS4. From the outset, most of the mechanics seen in the final game were pretty much locked in, but development was, uh, not going very well. Specifically, the stealth game experienced Koji Pro staff had a lot of trouble making the combat feel right, which makes sense considering the only game they had made with sword combat before this was the ending sequence of Metal Gear Solid 2. And while that was unique, it was, uh, not what I'd call intuitive. That being said, I can kind of see the thorough line between how you use the sword in MGS2 and how it influenced Rising, now that I'm typing it out loud. So, Kojima reached out to the god kings of the character action game genre at the time, Platinum Games, and they thought it was an elaborate shitpost. I mean, considering the respective size of the two studios in 2010, probably not a completely unforeseen response. However, this deal did come with one caveat. The setting was going to be changed to allow more creative freedom with the story, now taking place four years after MGS4. But, other than that, from that point on, everything was pretty much smooth sailing. The Dream Team got to work, and the game was re-shown at the end of 2011 as Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and would release a year and a half later. If you've heard anything about this game, it's probably that it's pretty over-the-top crazy, and that's true, but it's not just the endless stream of nonsense strung together by captionable quotes. This is part of the Metal Gear series, after all. If you haven't had a chance to get hands-on with this game yet, let me quick explain our premise here. Now there's a pretty meme. Exquisite. So the game takes place four years after the end of Metal Gear Solid 4, which means it's definitively the most technologically advanced Metal Gear game, as well as the closest game in the continuity towards the Zone of the Enders part of the timeline. If you know, you know. With the fall of the Patriots, nanomachine-based technology has come to a standstill, and in its place, most of the remaining private military companies have turned to cyborg technology. At the start of the game, our protagonist, Raiden, is working for, quote, security company, Maverick Security Consulting Inc., and is assisting an African government with ending its civil war and regaining control of the country. 
Shit goes kind of south, however, when rival PMC Desperado Enforcement shows up hell-bent on returning the country to the chaos whence it came. The answer to the question, what is their goal, is the same answer to why the Great Depression suspiciously ended the same day World War II began. Turns out, would you look at that, war is insanely profitable for certain people, and those certain people have incentive to keep the war-torn part of war-torn nation going for as long as possible. So Desperado does this by dropping in their army to cause chaos along with two of their leaders, Sundowner and Sam, and trust me, we'll be talking a lot more about them in just a bit. Sundowner distracts Raiden by sending a Metal Gear Ray after him and kidnaps the president's money in the chaos. Also, side note, why does a Metal Gear, basically the futuristic version of a tank, need to have the ability to roar like a dragon? I mean, if it's just because it's rad as hell, I guess I can't argue with that, but you know. Raiden manages to catch up with Sundowner and Sam as they escape on a train, but Sundowner executes some money, because I guess he only needed to keep him alive long enough so he could chain him up for dramatic effect. Sundowner catches a ride on a helicopter, leaving Sam to deal with Raiden, and it's here where you, as a player, might feel slightly outclassed. Sam is tough, you can't beat him no matter how hard you try. This establishes a quick contrast with the previous 15 minutes or so of gameplay. The level prior to this point was basically a power fantasy. You mowed through a bunch of jobbers and then sliced through a Metal Gear Ray like it was nothing. Now, Jetstream Sam is here to humble you, and oh boy does he. I mean, just look at how the fight ends. He puts his sword in the holster, then blasts it out, catching it midair and slicing Raiden's arm clean off. If that is not the coolest shit in the world, I do not know what is. In fact, I do not care what is. That being said, as hype as this moment is, would you believe me if I said it doesn't even crack this game's top 5? Yeah, stick around. Raiden gets a lucky save and Sam escapes, but one thing is clear. He doesn't stand a chance against Desperado the way things are now. Three weeks later, Desperado shows up again in the Republic of Abkhazia, a place I totally thought was made up, but turns out is actually real, and it's up to Maverick to put a stop to them. Armed with a new cyborg body, Raiden, along with his comrades Ryotaro Dojima from Persona 4 putting on a Russian accent, Boris. Let's take a walk in a bit. There's somewhere I want to go with you and Nanako. I mean, how does it feel? To fly like a bird. Like a bird strapped to a remote control rocket. <laughs> we will get you in safely, Tovarich. Literally the voice actor for Raiden's arch nemesis up to this point, Kevin. <laughs> Yet again, our paths cross. He may not even be in country, but keep an eye out, Justin. No. Uh, sorry. Possible war criminal, Doctor. Ich liebe Kapitalismus. And, uh, Courtney Collins. Raiden drops into the middle of the battle zone to get his revenge. Ends. Metal Gear Rising. We'll talk more about plot details later, but I want to talk about Metal Gear Rising's gameplay for a bit. This is easily the most complex, robust game I've ever talked about on this channel, so I hope I can do it justice. Metal Gear Rising is a standard platinum character action game, and so help me if I hear anyone call it a hack and slash or a 3D beat up or something like that. Your controls are pretty standard, you have a jump, a light attack button, a heavy attack button, an interact button, anyone even remotely familiar with the genre can easily understand what's going on here. Raiden is incredibly fluid in his attack movements. For most regular playthroughs, you can probably get by without checking the move list, because for the most part, Raiden's light attacks and heavy attacks will flow into each other no matter what order you press them in. This encourages a more aggressive, non-stop approach to gameplay, which is complemented by the rest of Raiden's moveset. If you press R2, Raiden can do a ninja run which will deflect bullets being shot at you, which is the coolest shit ever by the way, and automatically let him vault over obstacles. You can use the ninja run with the heavy attack button to close the gap quickly on enemies, something that's further improved when you unlock the stinger and have a cleaner way to close the distance without letting up the offense. I'm a big believer in games and make sure to have the optimal, most fun way to play them be reinforced by the gameplay systems and movesets they give to the player, and Metal Gear Rising is here to tell you it wants you to be up in your opponent's face laying down a beating at pretty much all times. Now, if you're gonna be in close range all the time, you're gonna need a pretty strong defense to go along with your offense. I've talked up defensive systems in games before, but this is probably the first time I'm going over one that's been properly well thought out. My passion for defensive options in games might sound strange at first, but hear me out. Most games get attacking at least mostly right. It's not easy to mess up. Press button, swing come out. Probably the worst you can do is like those games where you just swing at an enemy and they don't react, but to be fair, yeah, I hate that shit, it's pretty bad. 
On the other hand, think about the difference between an action game that feels really good to play versus a game that feels just alright to play. Now, think about how many times you can attribute that difference to a solid defensive option. And uh, by the way, defensive option doesn't strictly mean a block or a guard or something, it's just basically a term for how does your character deal with an enemy's offense. You get attacked pretty much as often as you throw out attacks in these kinds of games, so doesn't it make sense that just as much care should be put into the way you deal with those attacks? In fact, games with really solid defensive systems usually end up having those systems being one of the most recognizable parts of their combat. Bayonetta's combat is basically defined by its dodge into witch time. Souls' dodging and parrying mechanics and their slight changes throughout the series are usually at the forefront of any serious gameplay analysis about the games. A conversation about Dante's moveset doesn't usually get very far without the mention of the trickster style, and so on. Metal Gear Rising has what's got to be one of my favorite defensive mechanics of all time, a parry, and oh man is it basically the most satisfying parry mechanic in any game I've played. So when an enemy flashes red and gets ready for an attack, you tap the control stick in their direction and press the light attack button at the same time. If your timing is right, Raiden will raise up his sword and block the attack, leading to a satisfying clang as the hit bounces off. The sound effect and visual is usually enough to force anyone's brain to give them that quick 50 cc's of dopamine for free. And if your timing is really right, and you do the parry the instant before the attack lands, Raiden will counteract with a hit of his own, which is usually enough to finish off most weaker enemies. You can cancel into this parry from most of Raiden's moves, so you're never really too far away from your defensive option, meaning that with good reaction time, you can keep most attacks off of you. Now you might be thinking, putting the parry on the same button as your attack sounds like a bad idea, but actually, it's the best idea. It means that when you're on the offense attacking enemies, your parry is always right there. You're encouraged to keep up the attack, watch out for enemy counterattacks to flick your stick towards, to quickly reflect, and then keep going. You are literally firing on all cylinders at all times during Metal Gear Rising, and it leads to some of the most fun combat I've ever experienced. Now, while a parry might be great for most attacks, enemies also have grab attacks that'll flash yellow, indicating they can't be parried. For this, you have a move called Defensive Offense, which is unlockable pretty early, but if you ask me, it should really been part of your default kit. For this one, by pressing the jump and light attack buttons along with the direction, you'll dodge out of the way of an attack and get a few iframes. You'll also do a quick slash. I mean, it is called defensive offense after all. In contrast to how the parry system is meant to give you a defensive option that keeps you in combat, def off is specifically for getting out of combat, your get me the hell out of here option. Its main use is as a counter to grabs, sure, but it can be used whenever you need to get out of the way of something or to give yourself room to take a breather. This is also noted in its more deliberate button input. You have to press two buttons at the same time, as well as a direction away from combat, so it's not as much as a reflexive option as the parry is. Now, my real question is, can ride and dodge offset? And the answer is yes. If you know, you know. Okay, if you don't know, dodge offsetting is an advanced technique from Bayonetta where you can kind of hold your position in a combo through a dodge. This is obviously pretty useful in Bayonetta, since your whole game plan is getting to your wicked weaves at the end of a combo. While it's not as important for Raiden, it's still cool that a pretty in-depth mechanic like this made it into the game. Now, believe it or not, but the parry mechanic was actually incredibly controversial when this game came out. Message boards at the time were flooded with people saying it was unintuitive, it barely worked, or wasn't explained properly in-game. This led to a lot of people at the time just forsaking the mechanic entirely and brute forcing the game without it. So, is the parry mechanic poorly explained? I wanted to get to the bottom of it for this video, so I spent a while doing some parry-based experimentation. The direct wording of the tutorial is... First, follow the direction of the enemy's attack. Parry those attacks by executing light attacks of your own in the same direction. This is how you parry. It is the keystone of your defense. This is followed up by a text box that says push LS in the direction of an enemy attack and press light attack at the perfect moment. What Doctor is saying could muddy the water is true, but the text at the bottom is pretty clear to me. But I'm obviously a biased source. I've played this game like six times, so let's run some experiments with the different ways this wording could be interpreted. I tested holding the stick in the direction of the enemy and mashing attack, but that doesn't seem to work, which it shouldn't, since this would lead to a lot of accidentally parrying when trying to advance on an enemy. Let's try just straight flailing the stick and light attack button in the direction of the enemy. The parry window is actually really generous, probably a lot more than you'd expect. You can mash forward and attack pretty much as soon as the enemy starts going red and you'll block the attack. And as for the perfect parry, the window for that is pretty generous as well, and considering the reward, I think it's fair to ask you to tighten up your timing for it. 
That said, I am trying to empathize with the people who complain the parry mechanic is poorly explained here, even if I don't agree with them. I think the game may partially be, like, 10% at fault here. It's totally possible to squeeze by completely ignoring the parry mechanic, but you'll have a far overall worse time if you do so. I've seen people who fight Monsoon by ninja running in circles practically begging not to get hit, and it's enough to give me chest pains, but it is beatable. So, what is the best option here? Should the game hard roadblock you by dropping an enemy you have to parry early on? Probably not. There is a tutorial for it, and considering it's one of the only tutorials in the game, I'd argue the mechanic's importance was pretty well emphasized, but it's not ironclad obvious. That, and it is entirely possible to just accidentally mash it out once or twice and move on. So, in conclusion, yeah, I think the parry could be explained a little bit better, and it would definitely benefit from a better tutorial, but, uh, just learn to do it. It's free dopamine by the bucket load. Like I said, I never had an issue pulling it off even on my first playthrough, so the explanation in-game is fine enough for me. The mechanic is just so well integrated into the gameplay. I love it. Oh, good. <laughs> Why, that's very good. Yes, I like that. Metal Gear Rising's premier defining back-of-the-box gameplay feature is twofold. Picture this, in the first level of the game, once you've dispatched all the enemies, you're kinda stuck in this area. It's sealed off by walls you can't jump over, and all the side streets just lead to dead ends. If you played it, you know how obvious the solution is, but, but stay with me here. Suspend your disbelief for just a second. A player might be thinking, damn, how do I get to my blinking waypoints on the minimap? They try everything, and in a fit of frustration, start sprinting around and mashing the attack button when... Oh... You can, uh... You can cut the thing. Yeah, you have the ability to cut pretty much everything in this game. Cutting up furniture in some room? Check. Elaborate wood sculptures out of trees? Check. Cutting up fruit for the next office meeting? Check. And this extends to the enemies you'll face in battle. You're generally free to cut anything however you like, and the game will keep track of the number of pieces. Now remember, this game ran at 60 frames per second on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, so while there was slowdown, it's a miracle it didn't set more consoles on fire. Playing on a modern PC, you can pretty much cut with no limits. While it does have a function in gameplay, it's also kind of just fun to mess around with the system for a bit on different objects. Whether it's precisely cutting a lamppost to defy the laws of physics, or turning someone's car into an insurance provider's worst nightmare. Yeah, it does kind of look like blocky Lego chunks, but uh, this game is almost 10 years old. You can also slice limbs off of enemies, which will significantly reduce their mobility or attack options. Or you can try to give them the world's fastest haircut. Just a little off the top. The cats are invincible though, they'll dodge every attack. But, I mean, why would you know that unless you tried to slice the cat in half, you monster? This leads into the game's next defining mechanic, the Zandatsu. If your FC bar in the top left corner is past a certain threshold, you can hold down a button to activate blade mode, making the game go into slow motion and letting you cut in whichever direction you feel like. After dealing enough damage to an enemy, they'll glow blue and have a red square in their center. If you precisely cut through this square, you can press a button to use Zandatsu, which will rip out the enemy's, uh, boomer-flavored monster energy drink saturated fuel cell? Raiden will then crush it and absorb them sweet electrolytes through his finger pores or something. That's not a joke, by the way. The game actually refers to them as electrolytes. Zandatsus have a bunch of different animations based on a bunch of different factors, like what enemy you used it on, whether you were on the ground or airborne, etc. If there are multiple enemies, and you're precise, and the situation allows for it, you can also chain multiple Zandatsus together by repeatedly pressing the button. <laughs> It's also just really satisfying to pull off, like, especially the zoom-in and crunch sound effect when Raiden crushes the fuel cell. Despite how often you do it, it never gets tedious or boring. In fact, it actually helps the flow of gameplay, since it allows a brief second to catch your breath in between bouts of frantic adrenaline-filled action. Aside from being an insta-kill, performing a Zandatsu also completely refills Raiden's health and FC gauge, which has an important knock-on effect for Metal Gear Rising's gameplay as a whole. Since every enemy is a potential walking health refill, you're never too far away from recovery. This means Revengeance can be balanced assuming that you'll constantly be taking and recovering damage, upping the pace of combat. Mistakes are punishing, yes, but you can make up for those mistakes with a little well-timed skill. It's the same kind of function as Bloodborne's rally mechanic. Now, one last thing. You may have heard that Zandatsu means cut and take, but whoever told you this, I'm looking at you Wikipedia page, was massively underselling it. First, Zan, which is pronounced Kidu as a verb, does mean cut, but it's a bit more nuanced than that. A lot more powerful than the standard cut, if you will. 
Second, Datsu is take, but it's more like forcibly removing something from someone else's possession to yours kind of take. This ain't the polite take a second helping kind of take. Third, this word, zandatsu, it, uh, doesn't actually exist. Search whatever dictionary you like, but zandatsu isn't likely to appear in any of them. The developers looked across the entire Japanese language for a word to describe this action in their game, and came to the conclusion that their best course of action was to literally just invent a new word. And even for the English version, zandatsu is zandatsu. They probably told the localizers, like, no, don't touch that one. That stays. Of course, while the pace of combat is great, it's also important to mention the variety of the combat. As you'd probably expect from a Platinum Games title, there's a pretty wide variety of enemies for you to cut into pieces here. You got regular dudes who can be cut through pretty easily, armored cyborgs with a variety of different weapons, geckos from Metal Gear Solid 4, and... Monkey. Every enemy has a variety of different attacks and requires a different strategy to effectively take down. These fire-spitting enemies still break my brain, though, for real. Vodom Jerka? Vodom Yurka? Apparently they're called? Fun fact of the day. Each encounter provides a different set of enemies and obstacles that require you to tackle them in a different way. While you might get pretty good at taking out a certain enemy, when they're being supported by a different enemy that supplements their weaknesses, you'll find the strategy to use can vary up pretty drastically. For example, some enemies that require an aggressive approach might be supported by enemies that fire bullets, which you need to deflect by ninja running, meaning you'll have to take a more hit-and-run approach. Combat and enemy design like this is a big reason I think a lot of people get really hooked on the gameplay of Metal Gear Rising, even if they're not consciously aware of it. The game is relatively short, so despite the high number of encounters, there's rarely two encounters that play out the same. Raiden himself also has a lot of moves, so despite the combat speed, you're rewarded for timely, deliberate button presses. While your moveset starts off pretty basic at the start, you can buy abilities you can execute using button commands that'll further supplement your options in combat. On top of this, the store also features a bunch of other stuff you can use to customize your silver-haired cyborg. We got alternate colors, costumes, a literal sombrero, different swords, there's a lot to sink your teeth into if you can scrounge up the extra currency for it. You can even unlock boss weapons that'll give you different ways of playing that you can't get with Ryan's regular sword moveset. You've got this polearm that works best for throwing out multi-hitting quick attacks. You've got this twin-bladed sword that's heavy and leaves you relatively open, but packs a massive punch. You've got these sides that pull you towards an enemy. And that's it. Yeah, gonna be real didn't get a lot of mileage out of that one. Not gonna lie, I usually stuck with Raiden's sword, but it was fun to try out the new weapons for a level or two. Each of these unique boss weapons also comes with their own set of unlockable moves, so you're really encouraged to try out a bunch of new stuff to see what kind of moveset fits your particular playstyle. Something that's disappointed me so much it should be considered a crime against humanity is that in the Japanese version of the game, there was a sword called the Heavy Damashi. Why is this one sword so unique, you ask? Well, it's because Solid Snake's soul is inside it, and it'll dump quotes on you depending on what's happening in the game like a way cooler version of the Bastion narrator. Unfortunately, this piece of content never made it out of the Japanese version of the game. It's even missing from the feature complete PC version, and I couldn't find a mod for it. We'll be reunited one day. I mentioned you buy stuff at a shop, and you do so with a currency called BP, Battle Points, which are explained in-universe as a sort of made-up wacky woohoo good boy points currency Doctor gives Raiden. They're based off the Dremen points from MGS4. You get BP as you fight different battles, but your big payout is going to come through the ranking system that shows up at the end of encounters. Ranking systems in games always get my attention because I think it's interesting to see what the designers consider optimal play, i.e. what playstyle earns you the highest rank. Then, seeing if that playstyle leads to success during fights, or more importantly, seeing if that playstyle is actually fun. We all know a game or two where you can cheese out a good rank by doing some jank strat that works really well, but what's the point if it isn't fun to do? Metal Gear Rising ranks you based on the following categories. Acquired BP, how many Zandatsus you pulled off, your longest combo, and number of kills. You'll also get a bonus for stuff like not taking any damage. So from this, we can gather that Revengeance wants you to do big combo, avoid taking hits, use a Zandatsu, and above all, do it quickly. And I can confirm this is pretty much the way you'll be playing naturally anyways. You don't usually have to deliberately fish for a high rank. Playing well will naturally result in one, which I think is pretty much the best case scenario. You can also earn BP through the game's collectibles, and this game has a bunch of different collectibles. Certain enemies' left arms will flash green and red, and Doctor asks you to cut them off to satisfy his, uh, arm thing. 
If you do, you'll get a BP reward as well as access to new items. Scattered around the game are these enemies called humanoid dwarf geckos, which will net you a little bonus if you can track them down and take them out, even if they are a little... unsettling. There are also chests and enemies hiding in boxes you can cut open that'll net you rewards or even collectible items for the gallery. This is pretty cool, it comes with a lot of neat rewards like concept art and the like, and it's a nice bonus to aim for. The game is short, about 7 hours including cutscenes, but that's the point for these kinds of games. You're meant to replay them again and again to improve your skills and get higher ranks, and the collectibles supplement that. You also unlock a new difficulty mode with each clear of the main story, which encourages you to go through and reuse what you've learned. Metal Gear Rising also doesn't take the lazy way out most games do when it comes to difficulty settings, where they only adjust the damage numbers so that hard doesn't actually mean hard, it just means every enemy is a tedious sponge and it takes longer to do shit. Instead, Rising lets you keep your upgrades while also tweaking the amount of damage enemies do, as well as, most importantly, redesigning the enemy encounters to challenge you more. With the new playthrough, being able to earn collectibles like concept art, access hidden enemy encounters, and check out new areas is just icing on the cake if you ask me. So overall, as for Metal Gear Rising's gameplay, I can say without a hint of exaggeration, it's absolutely incredible. Everything ties together so well, and it's just great to play. I think I've played through the main campaign maybe six times total in my life across multiple platforms, and I could still go for another round any time. Little peek at how the sausage is made, but turns out Metal Gear Rising really doesn't like playing nice with Nvidia Shadowplay when the player has the audacity to alt-tab out of the game, which I usually do when I take notes while recording footage. I didn't know this, which resulted in 65 video files, almost 5 hours of footage being completely unusable. That terminal is most likely designed to download mission data and such into the UGs. A bummer, yeah, I thought, but then immediately I was like, well, guess that means I have an excuse to play more. If that had happened with any other game, I'd probably be seething and definitely wouldn't have had the energy to dive right back into it. But with Rising, it was as simple as picking the first chapter from the menu and starting again. Now, uh, it says here that a fair and objective critical look at a game requires a thorough explanation of its flaws or something? I don't know about that. Let me check my notes. Hmm. Nope, nothing here. Guess it's flawless. Pack it up. Okay, in all seriousness, the game does have some misses. Minor ones, but, you know. The first is a mechanic I'm pretty sure they only included in order for the game to have some arbitrary connectivity to its parent series, the stealth system. So for some areas, stealth is emphasized. There could be security cameras, or the game will give you a cardboard box to sneak around in, or there could be an area with a civilian that's been captured and you have to eliminate the enemies without being seen or they'll be executed. I mean, I get it. The Metal Gear series has been a giant in the stealth game genre from the day the first one came out on the MSX. I just didn't think they needed to bother here. The stealth mechanics technically work fine, I guess, even if it is as simple as hide behind wall and avoid sightline, and it is pretty satisfying to land that one-hit KO on a big enemy. The thing is, have you seen the rest of the gameplay? Why would I want to do this, when I could be doing that? Why would I want to tackle an encounter using passable stealth mechanics when I could be clearing it using superb combat mechanics? The stealth just kind of feels like someone on the team went, Come on guys, it's a Metal Gear game. It has to be there. Next on the chopping block are the sub-weapons, and you might be thinking, what sub-weapons? And, uh, yeah, fair point. Who actually uses these? Not only do you have to pause the game and go into a menu every time you want to use a different sub-weapon, completely destroying the pace of combat, they don't really mesh well with the rest of your moveset. You have to come to a dead stop, pull out the sub-weapon, then aim a crosshair at your target. You're just asking to take a hit. Their use case is extremely niche. I had to basically look for excuses to use them just so I could get footage for when I talked about this bit. Like, yeah, I guess I can throw a grenade at this dude on the wall instead of just walking up and pressing X. Arguably, the only time they'd get any play in a non-weird sub-weapon-only challenge mode playthrough is against the helicopter mini-boss, which, I mean, is the worst encounter in the game anyways, so... no loss there. There's some other gameplay minutia, like Ripper Mode, this game's version of a Devil Trigger powered-up state that you get midway through, mostly known for its iconic cutscene. Doctor, turn off my morb inhibitors! What? This... this is madness! You... do it! All right. I am beginning to morb. It's morbin' time. It lets you slice up enemies without having to use blade mode, trading precision for power. 
There's also hyper-advanced techniques like blade cancelling, which is ending your longer attack animations early by cancelling them with blade mode, but I'm gonna be real, I'm not great at it. I've talked about most of the major stuff regarding the gameplay, so let's move on to Rising's presentation. From a purely graphical standpoint, I gotta say, Rising looks really good. Especially for a game targeting 60 frames per second on the console generation with 256 megabytes of video memory. Yeah, think about that one for a sec. There are some obvious shortcomings caused by this. While character models are really detailed, some of the environments are a little less so, but most were designed for function over form. One thing though, these levels are separated by the 7th generation's favorite gimmick. That is, the hidden loading screen. You know what I'm talking about, elevators from Mass Effect and the like. There's even some holdover in more modern games, like the slow walk tight squeezes in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Summed up basically, they're the way a developer masks a loading screen by forcing the player to stop and wait or something. Now don't get me wrong, these were a pretty clever idea at the time, but they haven't aged very gracefully now that hardware has improved. In Metal Gear Rising, this takes the form of Raiden stopping to receive a codec call from one of the boys back at the base every now and then. Some of these just last way too long, and they're pretty pace-breaking. You can tell some of these conversations were put here just to buy time for the system to load the next area. And the thing is, these had to be made with the slowest system in mind, which at the time was the PS3's 2X Blu-ray drive. Now if you're not sure what 2X means, and uh, maybe I didn't until I googled it, hoo -hoo, let's put this into perspective. A 2X Blu-ray drive can read about 72 megabits of data per second, which is 9 megabytes. For reference, the PS5's hard drive can read data at a rate of, oh, you know, 5.5 gigabytes per second. Yeah, I'm not good at math, and the PS5's hard drive is an absolute monster, but even your standard $50 PC SSD can read at a rate at about 3 gigabytes per second. That's, like, unfathomably faster. If your machine is up to it, you can skip these codec calls by mashing triangle, but you're obviously missing out on a lot of story if you do, so I can't recommend doing that. You're just gonna have to live with them. I do gotta say, the designs for everything are on point though. I don't know how I can explain this without just drooling out of my mouth and calling everything cool, but I mean, look at the different characters in this game. Each one is distinct and stands out, and they all have a design that expresses their personality visually. I never get sick of looking at the concept art for this game. On the Platinum Games website, there's an article by the character designer, Cho, explaining the visual design of the game. He brings up a lot of good points here. Up until now, the Metal Gear game's designs were mostly done by Yoji Shinkawa, and I mean, how are you gonna compete with Yoji Shinkawa? But the thing is, you could have fooled me, you know what I'm saying? You could have told me that the bosses in this game were done by Shinkawa, and I would have been like, yeah, I buy that. Platinum's in-house designers really knocked it out of the park by making the characters in a Metal Gear game feel like they're characters from a Metal Gear game, which is a weird sentence to say out loud, but you get what I mean. Speaking of good design, while this game does have a tight scope, setting-wise, it's not afraid to think up of any bullshit excuse to have you go to a cool area. You probably know the one I'm talking about. There's this full-ass five-story Japanese garden inside the evil corporate HQ, which is explained away by saying, yeah, someone on the board is a huge weeb or something. Yeah, whatever you say. I don't care. It's cool as shit. It's the best looking area in the game. You get to run across Japanese rooftops like you're playing Sekiro or something. Ah, yes. Very wabi-sabi. I am in tune with the mono no aware. Hey, get out of here. I'm trying to enjoy the authentic Nihon culture. The game knows it just wanted an excuse to make a cool environment. It's even referenced in the dialogue. Raiden is like, a Japanese garden, why do I need to go there? Does it have something I need? And Doc is like, no reason my man, quit asking questions, just get in. Like I said, I'm not complaining, I'm 100% down for stuff like this. Not much more to say about the visuals in general, but there was one weird thing I noticed. The game uses a slow motion effect a few times, but, uh, it's not really like any other slow motion I've ever seen. They just lowered the frame rate for when they needed the slow-mo effect, but it doesn't look like they had enough in-between frames for the animation to make it look like actual slow-mo. The end result is in some places the effect is implemented, it makes it look like your PC is on the verge of a stroke, before you notice, oh, nah, it's supposed to look like that. Minor thing, but I did pick up on it back then, and it still sticks out like a sore thumb today. Now, you can't see me, but I've put my palms together in preparation to talk about this next bit. Yes, it is time. My segues are complete. We gotta talk about this game's music. I say this with full seriousness. When Metal Gear Rising was released, its approach to dynamic music was the best in the entire industry, and it has not been top since. I don't think I've ever come across a game that's done it as well as Rising has, and I've, uh, played a video game or two.
If you know of any games that do it as good or better than Rising, I implore you to let me know. In case you have no idea what the hell I'm on about, Rising basically set the standard for dynamic music, which is music that changes based on what's happening in the gameplay. Seriously, I have never encountered a game that's had the music change so seamlessly and pull off such hype results. Every track is just an absolute banger. I get chills every time I think about the specific parts in the boss fights where it transitions. Even if you've never played the game before, you've probably at least heard about this next bit. I've played this game through so many times, but when I got to the Metal Gear Ray fight for this playthrough, even when I knew the exact second it was gonna kick in, it hit me like it was day one back in 2013. I mean, just listen to it for yourself. I almost jumped out of my chair and you bet your ass I started screaming it was so good. And the dynamic music kick-ins don't slow down from here. Since the Ray example is the first time it happens in the game, it's likely the one players remember the most, but it's in every single boss fight. Time to leave them all behind. I finally found one. Standing here, I realize. If you've played the game, you know exactly what I mean. All of this was done by, would you believe, the guy who did the music for Disney's Toontown. Yeah, I only know that from watching Maxor's video, but I mean, that's the kind of info you gotta go check for yourself. It just seems so unbelievable. Speaking of the music, it's time for my official, unofficial Metal Gear Rising boss music power ranking. My opinions on what the best tracks are are somewhat... Mm, controversial, if what I've googled is to be believed, so let me know what your favorite tracks are down below. Now don't get me wrong, there ain't a miss on here. Every single one of these tracks is good, it's just that some are more good than others. I'll be ranking the nine main vocal boss themes, so let's blow through them real quick. Number nine, Hot Wind Blowing. Nothing real notable about it, it's still great, but it's probably the weakest of the bunch. Number eight, Stains of Time. It's high energy, but that's really all it is. Number seven, Rules of Nature. The Rules of Nature kick-in is the best bit, but there's not much other than that. Number six, I'm my own master now. Good theming on the breaking free from chains. Number five, A Stranger I Remain. The only female vocal track, and it's a perfect fit for its boss fight. Number four, Collective Consciousness. The Fires of Greed section is straight heat. Number three, It Has to Be This Way. Good enough to have its own subgenre of meme based off it. Number two, The Only Thing I Know For Real. The perfect track for a white-knuckled one-on-one -on -one duel. Which leaves us with the last one. Number one, Red Sun. I know this is commonly considered to be the worst one, but I really like its grungy, rough feeling. Maybe you disagree with a few placings on the list. That's totally cool. I could definitely see any of these being someone's personal favorite, and to me, that's the best part about this OST. Shoutouts to A Soul Can't Be Cut, which isn't a boss theme, but a damn good vocal track in its own right. This next sentence is probably going to be the most 2013 thing you'll hear today, but it's integral to the history of Metal Gear Rising in the public zeitgeist. Man, remember when everyone was screaming for a Kill la Kill game made by Platinum that had this style of dynamic music in it? I mean, it made perfect sense. Both Rising and Kill la Kill had that same over-the-top bonkers edge combined with high-speed sword action. It was basically all anyone was asking for for, like, two straight years. Then, in 2019, when the iron was ice cold, we finally got a Kill la Kill game, and it was made by Arc System Works, the developers behind Guilty Gear. And man! It was- it was terrible. Let's talk, talk about some real monkey paw shit. Since we're on the subject about the bosses and their music, let's talk about Rising's characters, both heroes and villains. The bosses in this game are called the Winds of Destruction, and they're all named after... Uh, I don't know how to put this. Famous winds? You got Mistral, Monsoon, Sundowner, and Jetstream. Also, Kamsen, but no one cares about Kamsen. I think it's pretty cool that these bosses are all heavily based off Dead Cell. I'm not talking about the 2018 roguelike, Dead Cells. I mean the group of bosses from MGS2. You know the ones. Netflix Castlevania's Alucard Without Makeup, Lucky, Punish Dr. Octopus, and, uh, literally just an overweight guy. Each of these bosses also serves a purpose in a combat sense, forcing you to come to grips with the game's mechanics. 
Mistral is your intro to the bosses, and teaches you to alternate between defending against multi-hitting close-up attacks and ranged ones, as well as using precision cuts to disarm an opponent. Monsoon requires you to master parrying attacks coming from all directions, as well as the perfect parry to open them up for damage. It teaches you not only to react to attacks coming straight up to your face, but also to be able to pivot in different directions at a moment's notice. They must have really liked these first two fights, since they make you do them again against generic copies midway through the game. Look, I got no issues with a boss rush area in an action game, but it was a pretty fucking bold call to put Monsoon Round 2 exactly 15 minutes after the real thing, I'll tell you that for free. Moving on, Sundowner teaches you how to be precise with blade mode, not only to break through his shield to open him up to attacks, but also to slice the individual panels off without hitting the explosive bits. You have to learn not only how to line up your strikes, but also how to be quick with it, since your FC gauge isn't gonna last forever. Then, the fight with Sam is the classic rival battle. You know the one. Dante vs. Virgil, Bayonetta vs. John, a one-on-one -on -one fight with someone whose moveset is pretty much the same as yours, and you have to prove you're better. Then, in the fight with Armstrong, all of these things that you've learned up to this point come together in an explosive finale. It's just such a perfect progression. Every technique you learned on the way here, you use in this final boss fight. The final boss sequence also mirrors the pattern behind every other Metal Gear game as well. I want you to think back to the Solid series and their final boss sequences. They pretty much always follow the same pattern. Fight the big robot, then fight the person behind it. Metal Gears slash Shagahods are weapons capable of causing terrible destruction. Big robot bad, yes, but they're just tools to an end. They're not evil. It's the people behind them who have wills and motives that use them for said purpose, and Metal Gear Rising follows this tradition. The personalities of the bosses are also a standout. Each of them have their turn at taunting Raiden before the fight starts. They've all got their motives and backstories and reasons for being here. Obviously, you can't have a proper conversation about Metal Gear Rising's villains without mentioning Big Man Armstrong, but we'll save his methods and motivations for the spoiler section. That leaves us with our good guys, and me putting them after our cast of villains ain't no accident. A few familiar faces from MGS4 return, but for the most part, we've got a whole new cast here. I already mostly went over them before, so I'll keep this quick. They're not exactly bastions of personality, but they all serve their purpose in the story. Boris is big Russian energy. I like Kevin, he's kinda like Raiden's Otacon. Doctor is like comic relief and has a few jokes throughout the campaign, but some of them do fall flat. And something I can use to access the lab's main server? Perhaps. But first you need to take a dump. I... wait, what? <laughs> and people say Germans aren't funny. One thing I noticed for this playthrough, however, is that the third member of Maverick, Courtney, is like barely given any screen time. I can't say much about her other than she was, undeniably, a character. And last, who could forget our complex hero, Raiden. If you've played through the rest of the series, you'll know Raiden's, uh, been through some shit. I hear it even rained on his birthday or something. Being a child soldier, he earned the title Jack the Ripper for the stuff he did in the Liberian Civil War. Then, after being rehabilitated and getting his life back, he ended up being mind warped in the Big Shell incident by the same guy who trained him to be a killer in Liberia in the first place. All this to say is that Raiden is a character that has a lot of stuff to work through. But, uh, I mean, he did work through it in the previous games. Or, at least, I thought he did, but then midway through the game he gets bodied once and it's time for Jack to let it rip. I get it's mostly an excuse to give Raiden a powered up state, I mean, Jack the Ripper is literally sitting right there on the table, as if that's not getting used. It's just that this plot point kind of shows up, he makes a mention about his pain inhibitors still being off in Chapter 4, and then it's brushed aside. It's not really a detriment to Raiden's character, but it does stick out. For the most part, however, Raiden's just cool, and it's easy to get behind him. Although, one thing, there's so many shots in the game with Raiden getting sliced in the chin, it's got me paranoid there's some reference I'm missing here. Like, once? Twice? Sure, but it happens enough that I'm pretty sure something's up. If you have an idea, let me know in the comments or something. Now, despite my love for Metal Gear Rising, I'm well aware that it's, uh, got a charm that might not appeal to everyone. A lot of people think it's too wacky, and I get that, but I think there's a hell of a lot to appreciate here. Every cutscene is just full-on, 100% adrenaline-fueled hype. Like, I mean, there's a scene where Raiden takes control of a stealth bomber and slices another one in half mid-air. The developers had an extremely focused vision on what would make for an exciting game and executed it out to the letter. 
I love every part of this, and while I wish I could show you a compilation of the best scenes from the game, we'd literally just be here all day. So after Raiden gets the lead on Desperado from Abkhazia, he figures out the American PMC, World Marshal, is the real face behind the whole thing. And yeah, they're like, comically evil. Their entire thing is to literally steal children's brains to train them up to be super soldiers and cyborg bodies. This game is about the bad guys stealing children's brains. Yeah, it's not exactly aiming for subtle grounded realism. And you know, that kind of mirrors what happened to our protagonist here. It gives Raiden a personal motive to solve this issue, and you know, that ain't the only throwback to MGS2 we're gonna see here today. When Raiden meets his kid in the sewer, and oh boy does that sound weird out of context, he tells him his name is George, like all them American presidents. When he says this, we can see Raiden looking visibly uncomfortable. Hmm. George. President. Raiden uncomfortable. I wonder what this could perhaps be a reference to. Obviously, there is stuff that goes a bit deeper than that. The Metal Gear series has always been known for its political intrigue combined with just a little bit of self-aware on-the-nose humor. And while Rising does revel in its own campiness and have its fair share of powerfully stupid shit, it still manages to deliver the same kind of stuff, in like a light version. There's a lot of focus on the war economy and war as a profit, and how institutions, like in this case an American senator, can be intertwined with it for personal interests. In essence, Raiden is standing by his own morals and sense of justice, fighting for people who can't fight for themselves against people who see them as dollar signs. I mean, he has to quit his job at the PMC to do what he does, because technically, saving children from being brainwashed into soldiers is illegal. Military cyborg! You are not licensed to operate in this area! You're in violation of state and federal law! Guess you'd better arrest me then. <laughs> 18 3 104.7 threatening a peace officer deadly force is authorized there's also some other relevant themes for thought being touched on here metal gear solid 2 kind of did a pretty good job at predicting how our post-truth world was going to turn out and rising is just like all right let's roll with it now that the patriots aren't controlling the flow of information, you run into the issue where the truth isn't hidden. It's out there somewhere, but it's just buried under so much garbage, you wouldn't know it if you found it. Again, Rising doesn't tackle these topics with quite the same finesse as its parent series, but you can tell it was meeting somewhere halfway between Koji Pro and Platinum. You can't really expect it to be all that subtle. I mean, the brainwashed child soldier room is literally shaped like a brain. Like... I don't know if that's a cool detail, or if it's so on the nose it set up a base camp halfway up the nostril. You make that call for yourself. That's all about the story I want to talk about for now, but as for the flow of the game, the difficulty curve as well as the overall scope of the combat follows a pretty consistent progression through the full runtime. You don't really hear about it nowadays, but whenever people used to bring up the Metal Gear Solid series, especially 4, it would get a lot of criticism for essentially being a... movie. In a similar vein, the cutscene to gameplay ratio of Metal Gear Rising is pretty high, but definitely way less than 4, if that's something that bothers you. To make a quick contrast, MGS4 is 18 hours on how long to beat, with 8.5 hours of cutscenes, meaning it's about 50-50 each. Metal Gear Rising is 7 hours on how long to beat, and has about 2 hours and 20 minutes of cutscenes, meaning it's about a third. Metal Gear Rising has its own story to tell, but I understand that for a fast-paced game like this, some people might take issue with it having too many cutscenes. Now I'm of multiple minds about this kind of thing, but to me, I don't think raw numbers or percentiles matter. For me, it's about feeling. When I'm watching a cutscene, do I wish it would just hurry up and end? Does it feel like we're just trying to burn through runtime here? Are we dragging this along? And for the most part, I don't get that feeling from Rising. I don't skip cutscenes in games, especially when I plan to make a video about them like this, since there's a lot of essential stuff you can miss, but I never strongly felt like I wanted scenes to hurry up and end. The cutscenes kept me engaged with their personality in camp, I was always waiting for what cool shit was gonna happen next. Every one just kept topping up the other. It was great, honestly. The only exception to this rule is the one I mentioned earlier, the codex scenes. There's important info that's given to you in some of them, but I can't help but feel like more than half could have been an email. There was one thing I noticed about the pacing on this playthrough that I didn't notice back in the day, particularly because I had to do it multiple times back to back this time around. This game is divided into eight chapters, if you count the tutorial. While one, two, three, and four to a lesser extent are pretty much the length you'd expect them to be, five, six, and seven kind of just blaze by, like the money ran out or something. Five is just one area from three played through backwards. There's even a trophy for getting through it in under seven minutes. Six is a single boss fight that ends in like five minutes, tops. And seven, while it has its own unique area, is uh, like 
two encounters in the final boss. Seriously, here's footage of me running the level from end to end in like 20 seconds. It's an airfield, so I didn't expect it to be massive, but you know. It's not like chapter 7 is short. Cutscenes included, it lasts about as long as 1, 2, or 3, but gameplay-wise, it's three fights and two bosses. This doesn't hurt the game in an overall sense, but I did get the impression that it's very front-loaded, then the last few chapters just zoom straight by. You didn't think we were done here though, did you? Before we can talk about the finale, I gotta mention Metal Gear Rising comes in clutch with three DLCs, all of which are included in the PC version. The first one is probably the least significant, the VR mission set. Throughout the game, you can find these hidden terminals that unlock bonus VR missions that you can access from the main menu, and this is an additional pack on top of what was already in the game. Now, I get what you're thinking. Game where the gameplay is incredibly fun, makes sense that you'd want additional modes to keep you playing, and that's true. There's a lot of cool remixed encounters here. Not all of these VR missions are winners, that's also true. There's a lot of frustrating ones with not all that great objectives, but overall, it's just a solid extra mode. Cool to have, but not as cool as our next one. Character action games are great because they give you a character with a huge, intricate moveset to play around with, and they encourage you to use that moveset effectively and stylishly. Two different people playing Metal Gear Rising might have an entirely different approach to combat. That said, this obviously does have an upper limit. Raiden has a bunch of different combos, special moves, and alternate weapons, but the selection isn't infinite. So how do you break past this limitation? Well, easy. How about introducing a totally new character? Yeah, our second DLC lets you play as Sam, Raiden's rival, and the gameplay is totally changed up. A lot of general stuff like the button layout and mechanics are similar, but there are some aesthetic change-ups. For example, Sam doesn't have a cyborg body like Raiden does, so all of his Zondatsus involve crushing the opponent's core through his sword. Gameplay-wise, he's a lot more agile than Raiden in some ways. He's got stuff like a mid-air dash, and his dodge move comes out a lot faster and has a lot less recovery frames than Raiden's does, even if he doesn't attack when he does it. Look at him, he can even do a little Dark Souls roll. Honestly, my main takeaway from his movement and this DLC in general is it turns out Brazilians can double jump. Can anyone confirm? Probably the biggest gameplay difference is his complete lack of a heavy attack option. Instead, he has the ability to sheath his sword and shoot it out like in the cool cutscenes from the main game. These attacks can be charged and change based on where you insert them in your combos. This means that Sam's gameplay is based around setting up an opening that lets you charge up a full quick draw slash to do big damage. To compensate for a lack of ripper mode, Sam can taunt enemies like a DMC character, which will make them hyper aggressive, but in return, let you cut parts off them without using blade mode. Aside from taunting just being cool in general, it sets up a risk reward situation, if you think you can handle it. It did lead to a few taunt to get bodied combos for me though. You can play Sam pretty much the same way you played Raiden and get by just fine, but it's by taking advantage of the unique things that Sam can do that Raiden can't where the real hype comes in. Also, as someone who's done Kendo, I really like Sam's stances during Blade Mode. Just an aside. Structure-wise, Sam's DLC is pretty short, and it's just a couple of reused areas from the main campaign. A bit of a bummer, but getting to play as Sam is the real main attraction here. You get to fight a few bosses from the main game as well, but obviously, as Sam, your game plan is totally different here. The DLC tells the story of how Sam, a vigilante who used to take down drug cartels, became an employee of World Marshal. He originally came to Denver to take down World Marshal. How did someone with such a strong sense of justice essentially enter the employee of evil? Their benefits package couldn't have been that good, could it? We also get to see how Sam lost his arm and him doing that iconic clapping webm. You know the one. <laughs> Overall, this is a really solid DLC, and let's be real, if you play Rising in current year, it's definitely going to be the PC version, which has this DLC packed in for free, so you lose nothing by playing it. Our last DLC, and one I'm a bit less hot on, is the Blade Wolf DLC. It tells the story of Boss turned Raiden's companion Blade Wolf, and how he originally tried to earn his freedom. The first few areas are framed as Mistral training him through VR missions, and then you play the first half of the Abkhazia level backwards. Now we're already off to a rough start here because the first few VR missions focus on platforming, of all things, and believe you me, platforming with a dog-shaped character is, uh, it's just not good. Then you get into the mission proper, and this next bit might be objective fact, might be personal preference, might be a little of both. I just don't think Blade Wolf is as fun to use as Sam or Raiden are. His combos are extremely limited, his heavies and lights basically don't interact with each other at all, his dodge sucks, his parry is weak, and he can take about two and a half hits before it's lights out. He's fast, but that's about all he is. 
So, optimal Blade Wolf play involves stealth and platforming. You know, two of the weakest mechanics in the game. Stealth is heavily emphasized. You can go through pretty much the entire DLC campaign completely unseen, and it's even a major mechanic in the final boss fight. It's nice to see them try to do something new and have you use an alternate set of gameplay mechanics, but it's definitively the weaker of the three playstyles. It's just too focused around the things the game is worst at. The final boss of the DLC is Kamsin, a wind of destruction not present in the main game, and while a stealth-based boss fight isn't exactly what I was expecting out of Rising, it's definitely the least notable in the game, both mechanics and character-wise. Anyways, Blade Wolf's escape attempt fails, his memory is wiped, and he ends up where we find him in the main game. Unlike Sam's campaign where it fleshed out his backstory and filled in some gaps in the plot, I think this one doesn't really add much. You could delete it, and it wouldn't really change your understanding of the plot as a whole. It just emphasizes how much Blade Wolf's AI longs for freedom. Worth playing, but I don't know if I'd replay it, you know what I mean. So last thing before the finale, why has MGR lasted this full 10 years and suddenly bounced back with a revengeance? That's a good question. I don't know if I have a 100% accurate answer for it. First of all, other than the walkie-talkies, this game hasn't really aged a day, gameplay-wise. It's just as good now as it was back then. Story-wise, I'd argue that some of its themes have only gotten more relevant over time. Even its humor has evolved with the time. People have inserted jokes and tropes that were invented well after this game's release and retroactively assigned them to Rising, and they've just worked. The term e-girl didn't exist in 2013, but now people are like, Miss Straw's an e-girl, and yeah, I see it. This game's dialogue also has a way of sticking in your brain. I unironically incorporated quotes like, now you're just being nasty, and yes, that's good, I like that, into my everyday speech. Cringe, I know, but stick with me here. It was only during this replay where I saw those scenes again and was like, oh yeah, that's where I got those from. It's just insanely quotable. Combine that with a few memes like standing here I realize hitting it big, and you've got this snowball effect that's led to where we are today. Seriously, I thought the MGR wave was going to be over in a few weeks when it started in 2021, but that was nothing compared to now. I think we have two camps here. One are people like me, who love this game when it came out and are chomping at the bit to share it with more people. And two, new faces discovering this game for the first time. And I think right now, more than anything, the price is right. Full price might have been a big ask for this game, especially for a more mainstream audience who would just play it once and be done with it. But you can currently grab it on Steam for a fraction of that. So it's a cycle. People see the hype, the barrier to entry cost is low, people pick it up, and repeat. That, and maybe one more thing. It's safe to say that the mid-2010s to now have seen the rise of the... prestige game. You know what I'm talking about, those massively big-budgeted games with grounded gameplay and intricate storytelling. Games that are dramatic and take themselves seriously. The term AAA has basically turned itself to mean this sort of thing in the last half decade. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of these are really great games. I mean, I like a few of them. But with that comes, I think, a desire to play something that's, well, not that. A game where you can point at the screen and go, that's the stupidest shit. I love it. A game that's not afraid to not take itself seriously and just go full focus on the gameplay. And that's where Metal Gear Rising comes in. I mean, hell, that's where games like Doom Eternal come in. There's a place for all kinds of games in the current landscape, and maybe Rising is a game we didn't really know we needed back then in 2013, but it's one we need right now. So seriously, give this game a shot. There's a reason why people who like it are so vocal about it. There's a reason why people went absolutely nuts when that fake Metal Gear Rising 2 teaser was shown at that Taipei game show. Either way, I hope Metal Gear Rising and games like it keep living on like this far into the future. Anyways, with the armchair philosophy discussion out of the way, it's time to talk about this game's finale. It's not like I've been holding back much, but here's your spoiler warning. Skip to here if you don't want to know what the whole plot's really about. You weren't really planning to skip this part, were you? So Sundowner reveals Operation Tecumseh, named after a curse placed on American presidents that would cause them to die in office every 20 years. Thanks, Wikipedia. Colorado Senator Stephen Armstrong is planning to kill President Hamilton on his trip to Pakistan and blame it on a bunch of rebels, giving them an excuse to go to war and keep them sweet blood bucks rolling in. While Raiden takes out Sundowner no problem, the plan is set to go off in three hours, and I checked Google Flights, that math don't add up. Raiden's only option is to take a Mach 23 RLV from a nearby facility, but first, he's gotta escape Denver. I'm glad to see that you are alright. It's time you got out of Denver. Raiden finds, and quote, acquires a bike that we learned from the Sam DLC was Sam's bike, and meets Sam en route to the facility who challenges him to their final duel. I don't know, man, maybe he just wants his bike back. 
Raiden wins, but in the end, Sam's motives were hard to read. Maybe that'll be important for a future plot event, wink wink. Sonny, the same one Raiden saved from the Patriots, hooks our boy up with a jet, and he makes it to the airbase with just minutes left on the clock. After the blink and you'll miss it final level, Raiden goes up against first boss number one, Metal Gear Excelsius, basically a spider-shaped giant robot. This is probably one of the weaker boss fights in the game, but it does conclude with you getting to do a Zondatsu with a 50 foot long sword, so it does have some upsides. After you take it out, it's time for the exchange between Armstrong and Raiden, and this conversation is basically legendary. I've said this before, but there are so many great moments we'd be here all day if I wanted to show you all of them. If it isn't Saucy Jack, mother of all omelets, can't afford to fret over a few eggs, played college ball, you know. It's just so densely packed, it's incredible. The gist is, yeah, money is great, Armstrong likes the profit, but he has a bigger goal here. He's sick of the whole, you know, democracy and personal freedoms thing getting in the way of his vision for a perfect America. He wants to garner up public support for votes so he can become president and root out what he sees as the poison infesting the country. He's sick of this 24-7 stream of media and celebrity bullshit. He wants an America where the strong survive and rule, taking what they want with their own two hands by force, and the weak are shoved off to the wayside. He wants to wipe the slate clean and create a powerful America that can rule the world. And Raiden is what he sees as an ideal citizen, someone who clawed their way out of the gutter with their own two hands. Raiden isn't just opposed to this, he's fundamentally opposed to this, with his form of justice being to protect those who can't defend themselves. Raiden hates Armstrong, but Armstrong respects Raiden. Even though they have fundamentally opposing beliefs, Armstrong doesn't hesitate to pick Raiden up, dust him off, and offer a hand the second he thinks they might see eye to eye on some things. Armstrong is undoubtedly evil, and as Raiden says, batshit insane, but he has an air of charisma to him which cements how strong of a character he is. In the end, Armstrong sees that there isn't any getting through to Raiden, so he plays his hand. Nanomachines that make him completely invincible to attacks and let him completely take out Raiden and snap his sword like a pretz. Nanomachine son! This is the same way he took out Sam in the DLC campaign. Sam managed to slice off his arm, but even that wasn't enough. Armstrong used the sharpened stump like an axe and sliced Sam's arm clean off, explaining why it's his only cyborg part in the main game. The battle seems pretty much over for Raiden when Blade Wolf shows up with Sam's sword. Turns out, Sam did have doubts about World Marshal and decided to leave it up to fate. Sam is one of those characters that respects strength, so if he were to beat Raiden, he would double down on his loyalty to Armstrong. But if Sam were to lose, which he did, he'd do what he could to help Raiden. I'm just gonna let this 10 second pre-final boss clip play out. It's my favorite line in the game, and I think it speaks for itself. Armstrong! Duh! I said my sword was a tool of justice. Not used in anger. Not used for vengeance. But now... Now I'm not so sure. And besides... This isn't my sword. The final boss fight is everything you've wanted up to this point. My man Armstrong busts through the HP limit, having a 200% bar. Like I said before, it's basically a test to see if you've mastered the different mechanics the other boss fights taught you. It's a multi-phase, pretty long boss fight that keeps you on your toes constantly as you learn his different attack patterns, learn what to dodge and what to parry, and slowly chip away at his health. And once you're done? Well, I mean, you did it. Raiden pulls off a win on Armstrong, but he leaves him with a few final words. Raiden didn't let the law get in his way, he did what he thought was morally correct, breaking into World Marshal and taking down Armstrong, even if it was technically illegal. He thought the law was wrong, so he did what he believed was right. In essence, he embodied the exact values Armstrong wanted for his perfect America. He won, but by doing so, in a way, he kinda proved Armstrong right, even if their goals are diametrically opposed. With the matter settled, however, Raiden travels the world to carry out his justice, and the game ends. Now one last thing, uh, where's my sequel? I'll take the original story about rescuing Sunny, I'll take a continuation of this story, I'm not picky. Come on, look how well Rising is doing right now, it'll be a guaranteed Millie seller. Don't, don't make me beg. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not happening, is it? And that's it, as Raiden would say. We're done here. This is a game that's very near and dear to my heart, and I hope I've been able to present a pretty good case as to why. It's not perfect, but it's got so much going on that ticks my exact boxes. It's a game I'll never stop recommending people to play. 
Like I said, it's pretty cheap to buy nowadays, so if you're on the fence, maybe wait for a sale or something. I promise you it'll at least be a good time. Anyways, thanks for watching this video. Sorry it took so long to come out, it's been busy times recently. As for the next video, well, I don't want to give away too much, but let's just say it's the big one, if you know what I mean. Hope you'll stick around for that one. We might never get a sequel to Metal Gear Rising, but at least the Metal Gear series is still going strong. Oh, um, yeah, wait, that's right. Uh, there's always Bayonetta 3.